Hello and welcome to ATA's Econ Chat. I am John Humphreys. This is put together by the Australian Taxpayers Alliance and it is our weekly chance to have a, a casual chat, uh, potentially an interactive chat. If you want to jump in uh, in the comments, I'll try to get to them uh, if and when they come through. Uh, hopefully we can get the audio to work a little better this time. For those who tried to tune in last week, you may remember things did not go as planned. I'm still working out some of the bugs in this tech as I learn it, uh, being an old man as I am, uh, not a boomer, Gen X, you know, Gen X master race. Um, so, so welcome. Thanks for joining us. A few things to talk about. Uh, this is uh, off the cuff. This is freewheeling, but we've got a few topics that come up as they do each week. Uh, and there's a few, there's a few that I wanted to get through last week, which given that there's always new information every week, I don't think I can really justify going through all of last week's stuff in detail, especially since we just saw the implosion of the, uh, the crypto exchange FTX, which is causing quite a lot of drama in the crypto space. And I think uh, well worth exploring that topic in a bit of detail uh, and unpacking what that means for the crypto world. But before I do, I want to, uh, I want to give a shout out to the book that I was talking about last week. Now, I was talking about it unsuccessfully because I believe the audio was so bad none of you heard me, but the book is White Elephant Stampede uh, and edited by David Grayson, Bruce Kingston and Scott Prasser. Uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago and uh, when, when quizzed on different topics, uh, someone, you know, interactive chat, go in, say hi, say something in the comments. Uh, someone asked about uh, the viability or the efficacy of government investment projects and infrastructure projects uh, as a justifiable role of government. And as I said at the time, I didn't know this book was about to come out, but fortuitous timing. As I said at the time, it can be justifiable. The problem is they look great in theory, but when the government runs a big infrastructure investment project, they nearly always come in over budget, significantly double, triple, more over budget and over time. So it, when investment projects look good in theory, uh, still sometimes we need to cast a, skept cast a skeptical eye over them. And then thankfully this book comes out uh, full of anecdotes talking about exactly that lesson. Uh, so obviously I'm not going to read the whole book to you here, but it's uh, full of good examples, uh, overspends, uh, white elephants, projects that sound great in theory or, or great hypothetically, or if you, uh, you, you pay an appropriately incentivized consultant, they can come up with a, a benefit cost analysis that's favorable. But uh, things like the, the the submarines, that's an obvious one, COVID safe, uh, the Olympics. But this is the one that really caught my eye and, and get a hold of this one. A 6 million payroll system that cost Queensland 1.2 billion. Anyway, uh, recommend uh, getting this. Uh, let me see if I can work out this tech here. Um, you can pick it up from Connor Court Publishing. There should be the uh, email address, not the email, the URL uh, at the bottom if I've got that right. And at the ATA, we're running a little competition here. We're keen to hear more examples, whatever your favorite or maybe favorite's the wrong word, uh, most infamous example of a white elephant, a government boondoggle. Please check out the website there, taxpayers.org.au, white elephant stampede. Give us your example and we'll give you a free signed copy of the book. Uh, so... That's a bit of fun. Uh, so that was what I spent a lot of last week talking about, and then none of you could hear me. Uh, so uh, done now. I will dive forward. Before we jump in, and I really do want to talk about the um, the, the collapse of the crypto exchange, uh, FTX, which is uh, could be the end run of our time, right? the Bernie Madoff of our time. This is a big financial scandal that is sending massive ripples through the crypto world. But before we do that, uh, we are joined here by my comrade in arms, at the ATA, uh, Barkley McGain. Uh, Barkley, how you doing? Fantastic, thanks, John. Yeah, it was um, it was good. I, I was just tuning in, and I I heard you were talking about the um the white elephant stampede, and the thing that stuck out to me the most was not just the ones that I knew. Obviously, we know that Olympics run over budget every time. We knew we had the COVID safe at failure, but it was more so the things the ones that we didn't know, and that to me is arguably the bigger concern because it demonstrates what politicians and bureaucrats will do in order to sweep things under the rug when they stuff up. So, <laughs> but um, yeah. uh, awesome to join you tonight, yeah. 
Yeah, and obviously, I mean, the, this book could go on forever. I mean, they have to eventually end it. There's more than 10 examples of white elephants in the government. But I, I believe, uh, I, I didn't, throwing you under the bus here, uh, you're putting on an event, or we, ATA, is putting on an event for this, I believe. Is that coming up in a few weeks? Definitely, yeah, yeah. So we're looking at a date of um, December 5th, um, and we're looking to have a notable um, uh, politician um, speak on the, on the topic. Don't hold that against them, though. Um, and we will hopefully be launching it at somewhere in, in, in the Brisbane region. And, um, yeah, we're, we're looking to have a great crowd of people who are looking to hear more about some of the government's biggest boondoggles. Um, that is on a both a, a local, state, and federal level. Um, and also some of the book's editors. Um, so Scott Pruss is um, one of our big supporters at the ATA. So um, hopefully he'll be looking um, to, I guess, um, launch that for us. I guess a question which, you know, I guess this is a hopefully like an open dialogue here, John, is um, something that I haven't really had the opportunity to ask you in person is what is the efficacy of us going ahead and advocating for an upper house? Um, and what is the chances of an upper house limiting these kind of budget blowouts as like an extra check and balance of a government on of the day um like do you see that being a mitigating factor in having these huge blowout projects yes this is a yeah, question without notice this is a very queensland specific question of course every other state um has mm. an upper house queensland doesn't have an upper house i think abolished some was it 90 or 100 years ago now uh i think it was yeah, about, about 100 that. years yeah. they've had the anniversary yeah i mean as, as a general rule one of the well, the, the primary benefit of having an upper house is simply that it slows down legislation. So the frustration people have is that it uh, potentially could slow down good legislation. Uh, the benefit mm -hmm. is that it adds more checks and balances and more skeptical eyes over that legislation. So hopefully it also slows down bad legislation. And perhaps the mm -hmm. defining feature of where people fall on this discussion is, do you think politicians generally add value or do they mostly stuff up? So, because if you think they often stuff up, then, having something that slows them down is a good thing. If you think most politicians are mostly good most of the time doing good things, making the world better, then maybe you'd be annoyed that the, an upper house would slow them down. Now, as you might be mm. able to guess by, by the way I frame it and everything I've said in the past 20 years, uh, I'm in the camp that tends to be skeptical of politicians and bureaucrats. So I think more scrutiny for politicians is a good thing and slowing them down is generally a good thing. Now, exactly which things they slow down, maybe boondoggles, look, but a lot of these white elephants uh, happen in a lot of states. Like there's pretty good evidence showing the average size of the blowout and the average over time overrun. And a lot of that evidence comes from other states. New South Wales has a lot of the, mm. uh, those examples too. So it's not gonna stop it, slow it down, hopefully. Uh, probably a good idea worth doing independently of this. But yeah, that's, so a left field question. Um, just yeah. throwing out questions back and forth then. What's happened this week? What have you noticed? What what interesting topics have caught your eye? Um, I think one big thing that I, I've noticed is, um, you know, being a keen sports follower is um, the topic of the World Cup and and, and not, not about who's going to win and, not, and whatnot, but there seems to be a lot of um, ethics behind it, um, as there is whenever you do business or, or, or things in another country. Um, and the the local laws and practices in that land, and the, and the, the the World Cup is of course in Qatar. Um, they've spent I think nearly a hundred billion dollars of it. I think it eclipses the price that they've paid for all previous World Cups. Um, and uh, and a lot of celebrities and, and and notable footballers and even whole teams are trying to shine the light on Qatar's human rights abuse record. And 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 it's a shocking record. I mean, yeah. I hate to um, highlight it, but it happens to be the same in a lot of um, fundamentalist um, countries where, where they're, they're theocratic in nature and um, very archaic with gender roles and things like that. But the broader question that I had is... I noticed when... you have uh, studiously avoided pointing out that Qatar is a Muslim country, uh, and I will therefore also <laughs> avoid saying it to make sure that neither of us have to say it or hear it. Uh, so yes. thank you for that, <laughs> Um uh, so I, I guess the, um, the the question that I had was more so about like when is boycotting something um, an act of wokeness um, as opposed to when is boycotting something an act of no, this is a noble, good thing to do. Um, because we, we look at, you know, certain things like, um, you know, people boycott, uh, you know, Gina Reinhart, for instance, for what her, what her, um, her, her dad had said, um, which I guess most people can agree that that is quite a stretch. Um, and, you know, people boycott products made in Xinjiang province where the Uyghur Muslims are being persecuted. Um, but what do we do when we have a situation in, in Qatar? You know, is it is it noble to boycott the World Cup or, or are you just being a, a woke lefty for boycotting 
the, the World Cup. You know, I, it's just it's not a question that I have an answer to. Oh, yeah, neither do I. I hope it was rhetorical because I wasn't going to actually answer it. I was going <laughs> to say, look, I think it's um, it is a question writ large without a direct answer, but I think it's really important for us to notice the question. Uh, I, I sometimes say something that's a bit unpopular on my side of politics where I point out that, I mean, cancel culture might be an extreme version of it, but fundamentally what cancel culture is is a, a social feedback. Now, mm. I, I would argue it's an exaggerated social feedback. It's an overly weaponized, overly cruel social so, form of social feedback without forgiveness. But the concept of a social feedback, the concept of paying a social penalty mm. if you do things that people around you don't like, that I would argue is a fundamentally good thing. Uh, I got yes. into this discussion yes. with Topher Field on a slow chat last year, and I think it's what people need to recognize is there's always some sort of mechanism for regulating uh, or giving feedback to broadly controlling behavior in a society. And the options are mm. that it's sort of social and informal, and you could say because it's social and informal, somewhat voluntary, the sort of social feedback. If that's lacking, the only other option is politicians write laws. And, and those laws mm. are, are more coercive, more blunt, uh, force, in, enforced with less um, judgment often judiciousness. So I, I would say yeah. that we are better off having social feedback mechanisms. Now, cancel culture seems like yeah. a perverted exaggeration of that, but the fundamental idea of uh, social rewards for behavior you like and social punishments for behavior you don't, boycotting places you don't like, you know, you're more likely to buy products from businesses mm. that you appreciate and as it should be. That creates, that sort of social feedback creates the incentives for those businesses to beh behave in ways that generally please their customers. Uh, and that's a good thing. It's one of the reasons why businesses tend to do better than governments. So it's, yeah, it's a messy one. I, I don't have a clear answer. Yeah. I, I know that. And, and, and also, I suppose, building off, off that, John, I, I guess I can relate to what you're talking about there is there's, um, you know, being at university, I've got a couple of mates who um, are vegan. They practice a full vegan lifestyle. And um, a mate of mine, he's a, he's a vegan and a capitalist, which, which, you know, challenges a lot of the stereotypes and the orthodoxies that we often picture of the classical vegan with, you know, five piercings and, and, and green multicolored hair. Um, but, you know, the, the statement that he thinks it challenges is that there, are no, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. Um, and he, he regularly points out to me that the best thing for vegans, whether they care to admit it or not, and their lifestyle choice um, has been capitalism. It has been corporations realizing that, hey, We've got a certain, you know, um, five to ten percent of the population who don't who don't want the broad array of our products. Um, let's create a market alternative, and and they have. Um, and now there are stores you can find them pretty much everywhere, um, vegetarian and vegan stores, and and that is largely in part due to capitalism. There's no government mandate that they need to, you know, take up that store, and 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 they exist. Um, and, and and that's why I would also de decry the government stepping in to make that change. But no, it was um conscientious consumers. And I think it does demonstrate that there, of course, can be some ethical consumption under capital capitalism and um, and people can create change and vote with their dollars and vote with their feet. So, yeah. yeah, it's why sometimes the term capitalism can be a, a, an awkward term to describe the, 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 the politics that I think we generally share, but it, which I think is better described often as classical liberalism, mm. as live and let live liberalism. Uh, now that in the economic sphere is capitalism, free market capitalism. Uh, but that's not all it is. It also involves sort of uh, freedom of association. And that's the, the key to this, the idea of uh, social feedback, social punishment, uh, or even uh, boycotting things, uh, ostracizing people. That's all freedom of association, right? Freedom, freely choosing who you associate with and crucially who you don't associate with, including which businesses you don't associate mm -hmm. with or which businesses you appreciate because they might uphold your vegan or whatever other uh, ethics that, that you share with them. Uh, so that freedom of association is a key social element of classical liberalism. Mm -hmm. And they go together and it's, it's often forgotten that the, the father of economics, Adam Smith, his famous book, 1776, The Wealth of Nations, was preceded by his first famous book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he talked about the, the, the nature of the ways for, for people to interact in a moral and free society. Uh, and it is, it, it's never been true that capitalists only have uh, one eye clearly focused on only the bottom line or the dollar. There is a much broader understanding to the concept of human freedom, which uh, which this trickles into. Look, this is, um, well, I don't know, you can comment there if you like, but I did know you only had a, a few moments this evening. So uh, feel free to stick around. I don't know if you've heard about the collapse of FTX uh, and the crypto exchange or if you have strong opinions on in the crypto world. 
or if you need I, to jump I, I, up, I, then... I, not necessarily. No, no, I'm happy to stay on. Um, I, I've just been having a read of it now since you mentioned it. So a lot of people are talking about this this upstart guy. Um, what's, what's his name? Now? Yeah, what's Sam Bankman Fried. Is it? Let, Bankman let's jump into it now. Hundred um, percent. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I have the the. Well, look, I'm not going to share anything. We'll just talk straight to the camera on this. So the guy's name is Frank Bank Bankman Fried, which is uh, maybe an appropriate name. He's fried the banks in the in the crypto sphere. <laughs> uh, about three or four years ago, he started a uh, fund management firm in, in the crypto space uh, called Alameda. Was that? Al yes, Alameda. That's yeah. what I've got written here anyway. Uh, and then he soon spun that out to a crypto exchange called FTX, which very quickly became a very big exchange. Uh, I think these businesses at one stage valued up to $32 billion. I think Sam Sam Bankman Fried. He goes by SBF. It's one of these people that uh, calls himself an acronym, which I think yes. you know that tells you a bit about him right there. So <laughs> SBF apparently was worth uh, a couple of weeks ago was worth twenty four billion twenty four thousand million dollars. He's a thirty year old kid who apparently doesn't own any like long pants. He only wears shorts, uh, shoes with long socks into uh, wherever he goes into the Senate everywhere. Um, so this 30-year-old nerd has been just living in a party house in the Bahamas with a, with a polyamorous group of about 10 gamers and tech nerds, and they've been running this multi-billion dollar crypto enterprise. Uh, up until recently, he was worth $24 billion a few weeks ago, and now he's worth zero. He's just declared bankruptcy. Uh, FTX has declared bankruptcy, uh, and this has put a big hole in the middle of the, the crypto space. Now, when I say a crypto exchange, by the way, it's worth noting, now they can't use the term banks because the term bank is a regulated term, but crypto exchanges are in this sort of crypto sphere and digital currency land, this sort of uh, cloud-based economy uh, is basically like a bank. That's where a lot of people in the crypto space keep their money. Now, you can keep your money in your own wallets, quote unquote, or you can put it into exchanges that work much like banks with transaction accounts. And there was billions of dollars of people's money tied up uh, in FTX, which was one of the most trusted sort of crypto pseudo banks floating around, and it's all imploded within a week. So that's the uh, the, the, the big news there. I don't know. What have you heard? What have you seen? Um, yeah, it, other than what I've just been reading now, I've just kind of been, I guess, um, tied up with, with exams and, and, and other things and whatnot. But, but yeah, it, it's startling to realize, and, you know, I'm someone who, I guess what went pretty early on on crypto, and I've seen you know, the 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 highs of last year, um, towards the beginning of last year rather, and and now pretty much the the market seemingly bottoming out. You you wouldn't have thought it could go too, too well, much lower again, not providing financial advice, but you know it really does. I guess shine the light again on um, cryptocurrency, and you know we see all these startup companies. I mean, one of the biggest sponsors of the NRL this year was SwiftX, um, which was a a cryptocurrency trading firm um, that, that you could just use, you know, on, on your app, make, supposed to make it easy. Um, you know, it seems that they're tanking on all fronts, but I don't know. Do you think there's a there's a future for us to in a long-term transition? Well, I think or? there's much more to unpack here than this. So first, I just want to point out that the reason FTX and Alameda has gone down um, mm. is out-and-out out fraud, as far as we can tell, right? Nothing's been proven. He hasn't gone to court yet, but everyone's waiting for the guy to get arrested uh, it seems like FTX took people's money under the promise that the money would not be invested. So FTX is a is a, like a deposit deposit bank, uh, fully res, fully um, backed, right? They don't lend the money out. That was their promise. And then Alameda yeah. was their investment arm, and they promised if you put money into FTX, we would just keep it for you. If you give us money for Alameda, we'll invest it for you. And what it looks like is they've taken billions from FTX and lent that to Alameda. And then Alameda's obviously invested it. Uh, and then even worse, that Alameda, a lot of their assets were tokens created by FTX. Now, anyone can create a token, right? Uh, and then you can artificially uh, boost the value of that token by making it a little bit necessary and then buying up all the rest. And it looks like they've done that to artificially boost the price of this FTX token. So this isn't, a, this isn't a, an oops of accident it looks like it was intentional it looks like it was fraud we'll wait to see if anything gets proven uh it is all being done so out of the behind so you're, so you're not necessarily effort. saying it's an indictment on the future well i mean this, this goes to a really important point about crypto and i think it's I don't, I don't know if it's exaggerating it to say that the the vision of cryptocurrencies uh there's two almost diametrically opposed visions of what this means 
Mm. There's lots of discussion of, of digital currencies now, and people are talking about centralized digital currency. And I think that term should ring a bell on this split in the crypto world. So some people like the crypto world because it's online. That's nice. That's cute. But the, the main reason that Bitcoin and blockchain came along was to decentralize finance, to decentralize currency, so that there is no centralized authority that you have to rely on or trust. There is no bank in Bitcoin. There is no bank in, in DeFi, in decentralized finance. And what's happened is this, uh, this crypto space, half of it's been taken over by people that want to re-centralize it inside crypto exchanges. I mean, the whole idea of a crypto exchange goes against the idea of decentralized finance, right? Because people are basically putting their money back in a bank. The whole benefit of Bitcoin is that it was trustless, or at least you didn't have to trust another person. You just trust the system and the system was yeah. uh, public. So you didn't have to trust anyone. So no one could let you down. And the idea of taking crypto and then rebooting it inside a central organization like FTX or like any um, crypto exchange, again, requires you to trust people. And so it seems to step away from the, from the perception of the DeFi people who, who support decentralized finance. Putting money into a crypto exchange kind of goes against the whole ethos of why we're doing this in the first place. So I'd say there's a civil war going on between the people who like digital currency because it's online, but they don't care about the decentralized bit, uh, such as FTX, and the people mm. who like crypto precisely because they, they care about the decentralized element of not having to trust a centralized authority. And those two groups mm. are somewhat at odds. The decentralized people have been complaining about the exchanges for a while, and I think a lot of people are going to be doing a well, – they'll be depressed at the moment because Bitcoin prices have gone down – uh, but mm. a lot of those people will be doing an intellectual victory lap at this point. Mm. And they are still pro-crypto people, but they're pro-decentralized finance, decentralized currencies, right, yeah. not just mm. digital. You know, they're not fancy just because they're online. Uh, and this is highlighted by the fact that all the central banks now want their own digital currency. That was mm. not the vision of yeah. Satoshi. Right? That was not the idea of the, the, the fringe online libertarians mm. who were praising Bitcoin. It's not because they were hoping the central bank would control it. That's a mm. very and, different thing. In 2019, I mean, remember my first, I suppose, um, epiphany going into um, crypto, which is a, a world I didn't hadn't really experienced before, was back in 2019 at the the Friedman Conference, of course, run by the ATA, and I think it was two um, contributors in the in the in the freedom space, I suppose, um, Sinclair Davidson and and Chris Berg, who are very involved down there at RMIT in, in this blockchain kind of space and and in the crypto world. Um, what they were talking to me about was just kind of like an, a whole different language. Um, but I suppose, you know, getting a bit more involved in it now, I've kind of um, started to understand a bit more. But I'd love to hear what they kind of think on on this kind of matter and what it means for the future of crypto. So, you know, maybe that, that could be a, a nice opportunity to flug, um, plug Friedman in, in 2023. Um, of course, I'll bring, we'll back I'll bring them on this line. podcast, I think. Look, I, I think I can guess what their view is going to be. Um, I, I know the RMIT kids... I don't know if they like being called kids, but I know the RMIT guys quite well. Uh, and they are very much uh, believers that the benefit of blockchain is the institutional innovation of taking away the need to trust a centralized authority. They're very much mm -hmm. on that bandwagon, the original libertarian ethos uh, of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so that I suspect they would share the view of the people who were criticizing the idea that, you know, it's just about being a digital currency. Uh, Tim Lester mm -hmm. raises a, uh, an interesting sideline here. SBF, the, the annoying acronym man, uh, is yes. into effective altruism. And not just yes, Peter Singer, there's lots of effective altruists out there. So I, I had a, yeah. a friend who works in the crypto space. I was chatting with him this morning. Uh, and this was his takeaway. He was saying, hopefully this would be a dagger in the heart to effective altruism. Uh, I, I'm going to just... I'll, I'll let him say that and leave that one alone. By the way, the other fun twist to the tale here is SBF, Sam Bankman-Fried, was the second biggest donor to the Democrats in the recent midterm elections. <laughs> so that, that just puts an extra little political spin on this. I think he'd previously uh, promised or offered to spend up to a billion dollars to try and get Joe Biden reelected. So, uh, and, and he was regularly going to Capitol Hill uh, and lobbying Congress to regulate his industry, uh, very likely wow. to regulate his industry in a way that would establish him as the big player, as the Amazon in the field, that would make it harder for new competitors to, to compete against him, which is a very common trip. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is worthwhile touching on as well. It's just as a, an economics lesson. A lot of people think big business and big government are against each other. They often work hand in glove. 
Big business mm. often approaches politicians and asks them for regulation. That sounds weird at first. I'll just repeat that. Big business often approaches government and asks for regulation. Well, why would they do that? Mm. Because they ask for regulation that basically uh, requires everybody to follow what they already do. Like a business already has their procedures and they say, well, we're already doing it. Let's make it compulsory for everyone else so that no new innovator can come in and do something in a different way, in an innovative way. Uh, all the small firms have to hire just as many lawyers and accountants as we do because it's regulated now, it's required. Uh, and these big businesses often work hand in glove with politicians. And S SBF was doing that, working very closely with Democrat politicians to try to get his industry regulated. So cheeky bastard. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, I guess since we last had an, an ATA Econ chat, we'll... Um, uh, sadly, with some issues last week, um, has been the result of that election. Um, and I suppose maybe that's a, a nice segue there is is what lessons can we draw out of it? I mean, you know, it's hard, you know, as people who sit on the, the centre right of politics um, to be kind of, I guess, disappointed to see, a you know, an all-round bad administration with, you know, high high inflation and high prices of gas and an all-round a leader which seems largely incompetent um, has kind of been rewarded in many ways by seeing a negligible swing against his inc the incumbent party. So I, I guess, John, what's your take on, on that and what lessons can we learn? Yeah, I, I, I do want to respond to you there. I just want to of notice course. Duncan's comment down the bottom here, uh, just lamenting the fact that we seem to have got away from crypto as a medium of exchange. Uh, I agree with you, Duncan. So, um, and also Peter's comment here coming up. Uh, and the, the, the businesses, they donate a lot of money to politicians. Uh, they ask for favorable regulation. And then, yeah, then they, the ones that donate enough tend to get bailed out when they're in trouble. So clearly uh, SBF didn't donate enough because uh, it looks like he's going to get into trouble. But, yeah, the, the question on the U.S. election, I mean, I, I'm a political tragic. Uh, I did a couple of live streams with the, when the midterms came in. So I've been following it all quite closely. Uh, i got to say, in terms of the vote, there was a 5% swing. Now, Americans don't tend to think like that because they're the Senate race and the governor's race. It's not nationwide, so you can't really do a nationwide swing. But in the House vote, there was a 5% swing to the Republicans. It was just very specific where it was. Mm. So there's probably going to be a lot of lessons in there to unpack. Uh, too many for me to, to have a go at doing right now. Uh, but it's there was some red wave. It was just in all the places where it didn't make any difference. So uh, Florida was already Republican. And there was a massive red wave there. They, they went from being like half a percent ahead to being 20% ahead. You don't get any extra Senate seats for that. Uh, but mm. you do get a, you know, a much bigger buffer. And New York went from being uh, like 30% Republican up to being 45%. So a massive mm. swing to the Republicans in New York. But again, 45 doesn't get you over the line. So mm. it, it's interesting to note that it was very um, uh, hit and miss. Lee Zeldin and Roger Santos, probably very good uh, leaders in those two states. Um, mm. Yeah, I, th I think what it also shows is just how divided America is right now. Mm. Uh, there was it, it, It's the Fetterman Oz race, I think, epitomized it. Uh, you had one candidate who had recently had a stroke, well, recently, five or six months ago, and he still hadn't recovered. And it was really questionable whether he was up to doing any serious job, let alone the job of being a senator. And it seems like the majority of people in Pennsylvania said, we don't really mind if he's a non-functioning human. We just need to vote for our party because the other side is evil or, or too mm. stupid to, to consider. Or, or, you know, they, I mean, one of the, the lines the Democrats were running against the Republicans was that basically that they are evil, that uh, they were going to end democracy and America would be over. Uh, and if that resonated, that kind of shows a worrying degree of instinctive division uh, in the minds and the hearts of a lot of Americans, which is worrying. I don't know yeah. the solution to that. And I, I also think that it happens to be that there's a lot of division in the Republican Party as well. And I think we're seeing that kind of splinter off and we will see it splinter off um, more notably in the next 24 hours. As I understand it, President Trump will be announcing that he's running for president within the next 24 hours. So everyone tuning in should be staying tuned for that. It should be around um, early to mid tomorrow morning. Um, but as to where, where the Republican Party go now, I mean, obviously they've got Trump, who's managed to do it before in 2016, but many would say that he's damaged goods after 2020, where it looked like, you know, he was a bit of a sore loser. Um, and 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 where should they go? Obviously, the, the second pick would be Ron DeSantis, who um, Trump continues to attack. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very tricky issue right now. I've seen Rupert Murdoch has clearly 
thrown his support behind Ron DeSantis, even going so far as to um, demand that Trump pull out of the race. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of truth to what, you know, that the Murdoch papers are saying there in the sense that if they were to run a, you know, concurrent race towards the end um, in, the, in the Republican primaries, um, you know, Trump will throw as much mud as he can against DeSantis um, because he is very much about his own um, parts of it, almost though that he should probably run as an independent, even though that would severely damage any Republican hopes. But I don't know. Where do you sit on that issue? Yeah, the... <laughs> I would say, I, firstly, my pick is, uh, as it has been for the past eight years, still Rand Paul, but I think I'm the only one left saying that. So I, I, I take your point that it doesn't look like he's uh, even mentioned in the top 10 anymore. So ma maybe I need to, to get over that hope, but I still do think he's the... Um, we need the him to fight person. Dr. Fauci so he, he, he can stay in, the, stay in the House and do that. Or in the he, Senate, yeah, Senate. He's, in the, he's in the Senate. Anyway, I'm just yeah. throwing out what my preference is. Uh, as for Trump versus DeSantis, I think... Look, it's it's going to play out anyway. So I think the the dream of trying to get one of them to pull out early, let's wait and see. We haven't actually seen when they line up uh, on a bunch of issues yet. So I'm, I'm going to keep my powder dry on that. Uh, it is 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 two whole years to go before the yes. next. Like we only just finished the last one. Yep. So there's a lot can change in two years, and there's a lot of things we still don't know. So I'm uh, I also think for the people who 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 want Trump in or want Trump out? I, I'm not sure if they uh, their actions, th their intervention is necessarily going to be helpful. I was uh, re relaying the parable uh, recently to a friend uh, of the parable of the sun and the wind, uh, where the sun and the wind take a bet. They see a man wearing a coat and they say, "I want to get that." You know, who can make the take the coat off the man? And the wind tries to blow and blow and blow to blow the coat off. But of course, the more the more the wind blows, the more the man holds the coat coat tight to him, and then the sun just comes out. And shines and makes it really hot and so the man takes his own coat off and the, the the meaning of that is supposed to be that sometimes blunt force in trying to get people to do what you want by yelling at them gets the opposite result uh so I, i'm not sure at this point in time of uh, the pontification and prognostications about trump uh i'm not i think it's too early and i'm not sure it's going to be helpful to the degree that people do it so um so i'll probably just leave it there for the, the u.s politics uh Switching, staying on politics, but switching to our country for a second. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been following it very closely, given that they uh, they live in the wrong part of the country. But Victoria is having a state election. Uh, have you have you been following that at all? Yeah, a little bit. Um, obviously, a, a huge um, factor is um, what's going to happen with the minor parties, notably the, the teal independents. Obviously, we saw what we call a teal wave um, in a lot of the the wealthier parts and, and the inner cities in, in Sydney, Melbourne, and and in Brisbane, we saw a, a quite a green wave. Um, the question is how well they perform um, at this state election. Look, I think it's going to be hard for, for Daniel Andrews to not get re-elected. I think the Liberal Party has left a lot to be desired um, as, as insofar as providing an alternative to the incumbent government. They haven't really had a strong fixed position on whether or not they thought we shouldn't have locked down as far. And it's, it's a pretty easy position to take, in my in my opinion. Victoria is the most locked down city in the entire world. Um, and if the alternative to that um, is not really providing any difference, then what does that say about the Liberal Party? So um, I think, uh, you know, the, the hope is that there is not too much of a proliferation to those minor parties, um, as in the, 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 the Teals and the Greens. Um, and that we see at least some kind of broad coalition stand up against Daniel Andrews and and hopefully bring up bring about a, um, uh, I guess a crossbench a, a sizable crossbench in the in the upper house perhaps. Well, the upper house is quite a different thing. I think the teals are running in the lower house, uh, and and realistically, the the teal seats are probably seats that are trending left anyway. Um, but the. the the, the opinion polls suggest Dan Andrews is going to win again, which is, seems remarkable from the outside looking in, but I don't know the minds of uh, Melburnians. They, they seem like a strange bunch uh, <laughs> to each their own. Uh, it, it does reinforce, I made this point two weeks ago, it does reinforce if Dan Andrews wins how urgently important it is for him to not control the upper house, the legislative council. Uh, and that's the part. I've got a bit of a bias. I'm interested in minor party politics. Uh, and so I, I keep an eye on the legislative council and that's looking very messy. The the so-called group voting tickets came out a couple of days ago, which indicates where all the parties are, are sending their preferences. Victoria is the only place left where if you vote above the line, you just vote one, and then you basically trust the party to allocate your preferences for you. 
So which means we actually know where those preferences are going to fl flow uh, for everyone who votes above the line, which is 90% of people. Uh, and so that, that can be quite the set of Machiavellian games that are played there. I believe, by the way, Joel Jamal and Topher Field are doing a live stream in two days. So doing a bit of a deep dive into those GVTs for anyone interested. Uh, so that could be interesting. Uh, historically, four years ago, what happened is most of the minor parties got together and said, look, on our own, if we don't coordinate, all of the seats will go to the Liberal Labor Greens which is what historically happened. Like historically the Greens uh, would, or someone in, in their similar situation would have balance of power. And all of the seats go Liberal Labor Greens pretty much. And four years ago, the minor parties got together and said, well, if we do what we always have always done, we'll always get what we've always got. Instead, mm -hmm. let's preference each other before the majors. And then, you know, each one of us might not get over the line, but at least one of us will. And that's actually what we saw, right? We saw there's eight different regions. We saw eight minor parties or small parties that, uh, that were in this group actually get elected and you had this big crossbench. And a lot of people mm. complained about that. Uh, for the people complaining about that, I'd really like, I'd urge you to consider that before that, those seats generally went to the Greens. And if you get rid of this, if we successfully get rid of this uh, approach, those seats are probably going to go back to the Greens. And given that Dan Andrews is in front of the polls, what we're looking at is a Dan Andrews government with Greens control, which I think is a terrible idea personally. I mean, to mm. each their own, if you're a green supporter listening into the ATA's econ chat, then God love you. Welcome. Feel free to put a comment in the, in the chat box. Uh, but personally, I am quite worried about the idea of greens uh, balance of power, which is why I think it makes sense for the minor parties to work together, even with ones mm. that you might not always agree with, uh, or you don't often agree with to help get them over the line. And, and unfortunately it doesn't look like that's happened. The, the left-wing parties have done their own little agreement, and some of the uh, some of the right wing parties have done their own little agreement, and uh, a bunch of other parties have done an agreement in like the centre, uh, and so it doesn't look like they're coordinating, and I fear the winners from that will be the Greens. But uh, look, mm -hmm. you can always vote below the line if you're listening here and from Victoria and you're worried about that. Uh, vote below the lines, or the minor parties that have preferenced the minor parties before the majors. Uh, the uh, Liberal Democrats, of course, I would say that, uh, as everyone, <laughs> as many people would know, I'm involved with them, uh, but they have. So Liberal Democrats preferences the minors before the majors. So do the shooters. So does the DLP most of the time. Uh, and so does Family First. So um, mm. unfortunately, if you vote for another minor party above the line, your vote's going to scatter and you may well end up helping the Greens. So um Yes. Beware, beware. Mm. And, and check out that live stream with Topher and Joel, uh, Joel Jamal from uh, Turning Point Australia and Topher Field yeah, from yeah. Topher Field. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Drew's UAP are the worst. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure of that. UAP's clearly done a deal with the Liberals, so they, um, the accusation against them is that they are a Liberal feeder party at the moment. Look, obviously, they get something from that deal as well. So their hope is that they're not a feeder party. Their hope is that they will get Liberal preferences. Um, but, yeah, so UAP's going straight to the Liberal Party. So a vote for mm -hmm. UAP is uh, probably going to be a vote for the Liberals. It's going to hurt the other minor parties. Uh, unfortunately, the Freedom Party and One Nation uh, have also gone to the Liberals before the Liberal Democrats, before the DLP, before the shooters. Uh, so they're also going to potentially help uh, decrease the number of minor parties. But um, <laughs> all right, that is as happens sometimes. Um, I All right, John, I've just got to head off right. now. Um, I've just got another commitment that I've just got to run to, but no, it was awesome to jump on. Thanks to everyone um, commenting um, in the chat. I've just been reading through some of it. This has uh, given us plenty to think about. So, um, yep, um, I'll see you in the office tomorrow, mate. Yep, I'll see you then. Now we can yes. get back onto economics as well. But there's one last comment. So I'll see you later, Barkley. Um, see you, John, mate. And uh, Melissa, I think the Greens actually lost four. I think they had five and went down to one in the upper house. I think they gained some in the lower house. My understanding is in the upper house, they went from five to one. So lost four greens, gained two Lib Dems. Um, yes, anyway, it's the election hasn't happened yet. So at this point in time, what we can do is just go out there. And uh, if you are as concerned as I am about the Dan Andrews government, uh, try to encourage a vote elsewhere in the lower house. And then in the upper house, we really do need to try and, and make sure that's not a, a Labour Green controlled upper house. Now, I, I've gone over time here. I'm going to try and keep these short and sweet, but uh, I, I like talking politics. So once Barclay brought it up, 
I was very happy to run down that rabbit hole. Uh, but I, I wanted, had a few other economics issues I was going to get to. I don't have time for all of them, but I wanted to get to this one quickly. Um, if it's going to work, let's see if I can make this work. Uh, this is uh, sharing an article written recently about the Australian Greens take on the Reserve Bank. So as uh, people, um, as you may or may not know, the Reserve Bank is uh, in Australia, the Reserve Bank of Australia is nominally independent and they set the monetary policy uh, in, let me just make this full, all right. Uh, they set the monetary policy in Australia, they determine the interest rates uh, and through that they effectively control how much money is uh, pumped into the system, how much base money, right? I, I think it'd be worthwhile doing a uh, an independent stream at some stage explaining explaining money in a bit more detail because it can get quite messy and a bit complicated. You have base money that comes from the central bank, the reserve bank, but then banks also create credit, which is fungible with money, which is interchangeable with money. So to effectively, you can say banks also create money. And then what actually matters is how much money circulates. Uh, and money can circulate quicker or slower. So to some degree, the actions of you and I, everyone, can influence how much money is circulating. So you have that base money times what you can call the credit multiplier, which is what the banks do, times the velocity, which is what you and I do in, in how quickly we spend money. And all of those three, three things combined determines the total amount of money sloshing around the economy. And the reason that really matters right now, of course, is that if too much money is sloshing around the economy, too much money chasing not enough goods is the cause of inflation. Right? So too much money chasing not enough goods is the cause of inflation. Uh, and so you look back to the central bank and you notice that the Australian central banks uh, put a lot of more money into the economy. So it wasn't that velocity went up. It wasn't that the credit multiplier went up. It was that the Reserve Bank effectively printed a, a lot more money. And you had a lot more money chasing fewer goods because you also had fewer goods because of uh, supply chain issues. And that's what's created the inflation we've got today. And that's what's necessitated the central banks, including the Reserve Bank of Australia, taking quite harsh measures in putting up interest rates. Now, I actually argued before, and I, I stand by it, that I think they should have gone more harsh. I think the central bank should have put interest rates up more and quicker. Uh, but either way, the issue is they're putting up interest rates to try and get inflation under control. And that's causing uh, one consequence has been the government has uh, started an inquiry into how the Reserve Bank should be run. And that's sparked a lot of people sharing their views. And one set of people are the Greens, all right? So the Greens, this article here from ABC News, the Reserve Bank and the federal government need to jointly deploy inflation policy. Uh, the Greens here are arguing basically that the government needs to have more involvement in the central bank. So maybe I'll, I'll just read through this as we go. Um, feel free to leave your comments and questions uh, as we go if you disagree with me or agree. Um, the Greens uh, say the Albanese government's review of the uh, Reserve Bank should also confront the limitations of independent central banking uh, as it's currently perceived. So they are drawing the independence into question. It's a common thing actually done by both the, the hard left and the hard right, not the free market right, the nationalist right. They're, they're both of these groups are skeptical of Reserve Bank independence because they want more government control, generally because Reserve Banks, when they're independent, are told to control inflation. So they're willing to make hard decisions. Uh, but the Greens, especially here, they want sent the politicians to have more control so that they can keep the interest rates artificially low for longer. So that, that's the, the philosophical background to, to this position. Senator Nick McKim, the Greens Treasury spokesperson, says the RBA must become more accountable for the consequences of its policies and should accept some responsibility for making inequality worse. Well, the, the inequality point is ridiculous. It's what you'd expect the Greens to say. The only thing the Reserve Bank, I'll, I'll keep repeating this because this is the mistake that the Greens don't understand. The only real thing that the central banks can control is how much money is sloshing around the economy chasing goods. And even then, they only have imperfect control on that. Right? Reserve banks, central banks cannot control inequality. They cannot control the growth rates. They cannot stop recessions. Right? All, all they can do is determine how much money, or not even determine, influence how much money is sloshing around the economy chasing goods. And if they get it right, all that looks like is low inflation. I would argue preferably no inflation, 
but you know, low inflation is, is good enough. Close enough is good enough. Um, so that's when they get it right. When they get it wrong, they can either spark inflation or runaway inflation, like we're, we're starting to see around the Western world today, uh, or a deflationary spiral. spiral. All right? But that's what happens when they get it wrong. This idea that somehow by controlling the amount of money in the economy, that causes inequality, that's just ridiculous. So he says, current monetary policy arrangements need to be reimagined to help Australia confront the climate emergency. Again, same response, what a, uh, the same ridiculous notion. The Reserve Bank is not God. It is, it is not all seeing. It can't do everything. It doesn't even control the microeconomy. I've discussed this before with, um, uh, I've discussed this before, I think two weeks ago, the crucial difference in understanding the difference between the role of microeconomics and macroeconomics. And the central bank, the reserve bank, is only in the macroeconomic space. They don't control the microeconomy. Inequality is an issue of microeconomy. The makeup of your energy system, so climate change, is an issue of microeconomy. The idea you'd get a central bank to try and uh, micromanage these issues uh, is, is, is ridiculous, right? They've got one tool to use, the amount of money they put in the economy, and they, therefore they can have one goal that they're trying to get right. And that should be stable prices, uh, low or no inflation. Um, they, they go on here to talk about how there should be different people on the board. They want more unionists. Uh, they want more people that basically agree with them. Uh, and th this is all basically just leading them to, to, they want the central bank to make decisions focused on anything other than stable money. Uh, which is a shame because it's the only thing that the central bank can get right is to stabilize money. Um, RBA is far more likely to meet its objectives if it uh, the diversity, diversity. Look, the, the issue here isn't the diversity of views. If you have, if one person thinks two plus two is four and one person thinks two plus two is six, you don't get the truth by averaging it, right? It's not that the truth is two plus two is five. What you want to do is get a central bank that is good at doing the only thing it's able to do, which is to stabilize prices, to stabilize money. That is the only thing they're able to do. They can't do inequality. They can't do climate change. They just don't have the policy tools. If you want those things fixed, and that's a question in and of itself, we can do a whole other session uh, on, on inequality. I would argue that what matters is poverty, not inequality. Uh, you know, Left-wing systems can make people more equal because they make everyone poor. I would prefer some inequality and everyone to be wealthier and less poverty. Uh, and on, on climate change, I think that's exaggerated and the, the costs of their policy uh, is far higher than the benefits of their policy. But putting that aside, even if you agreed with them, those are microeconomic questions. The central bank can't do it. So this is a worry, right? Because if we open up, if we want a review of the Reserve Bank, and they're not perfect, they made some big mistakes, um, but it is a review of a central bank. If it's going to get these crazy green left ideas, we could end up with a Reserve Bank that's even worse. And this is something to look out for. Uh, so he's talking about here the RBA's blind spot in housing. It's not the RBA's job to fix housing either. So again, house prices are getting carried away and they are getting too high. Um, thanks, Barclay. Appreciate it. Uh, but again, this, the house prices are caused by the lack of supply of houses. The Reserve Bank does not build houses. I mean, it's, so the, the, they've got this shopping list of all the things that they want the Reserve Bank to start doing. And the fear is if the Reserve Bank is, is told that they have to try and achieve these things, A, they'll never be able to achieve them. They can't. They don't have the tools. But B, that will mean they take the eye off the, their eye off the ball for the one thing they can get right, which is price stability, to try and get inflation under control. Um, Anyway, I, th I think we've run through this. This was basically the, uh, the RBA and government should work together to manage inflation. Well, again, this also isn't quite right in the other direction. Uh, the, realistically, that is the thing that the central bank can do. They determine the increase uh, in base money into the economy. The government controls fiscal policy, the budget deficit or surplus, but the budget doesn't actually determine how much money goes into the economy. So again, this uh, trying to get... Everybody to do all things just leads nobody to do their job well. The RBA should control money supply to get prices stable and inflation low. And the government should try to balance their budget to get debt under control. Uh, and then they should pursue microeconomic reform to boost productivity. Um, 
and the Greens trying to get everyone to do everything is going to lead to everyone doing their own job worse. So anyway, I'm going to uh, stop sharing that now. Um, I'll have to get a bit better at being able to, uh, to, to walk us through news articles as we go. But I do want to do that, uh, notice some news articles when they come out, uh, some of the crazy ones. Uh, and especially when they come out from The Guardian or the ABC, they get a free run. They just give all the lefty talking points. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile us doing a, a bit of a media check sometimes, mm -hmm. seeing what's being said and uh, running a bit of a critical eye over it. Um, another comment here from, uh, what's happened? From Pete, uh, interest rate control is a very blunt instrument uh, and it really can only do the one thing. It can uh, influence the amount of money flowing, in the, uh, flowing around the economy to try and get them to do everything there um, is a danger. Uh, yes, Martin, uh, these videos generally will be available. Uh, last week's wasn't because uh, the, the audio was so bad, it was unwatchable. So when I, when I went back and looked at it, and everyone was saying that in the comments, and, and they were right, it was unwatchable, so that one wasn't online. But as a general rule, these will be done as live streams, and if you, I, I hope you can come along and I, I take questions in the, uh, and listen to the chats as we go. Uh, but if you can't make it, then, yeah, these are going to be available on YouTube for the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, also on YouTube at my account, John Humphreys, and on Facebook, the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, and, and my Facebook page as well. So they will be on all of those places. Look, there were a few other things I wanted to get to, but I think we're going to have to do it next week. I wanted to keep these relatively short and sharp uh, so that I didn't scare people away. Uh, so I might, what have we got? Yep, I can come back to those next week. So I'm going to call that a day unless there's any uh, urgent extra questions or comments uh, coming in. Uh, but I think I probably should have warned you of that earlier. So um, thank you all for tuning in. I hope the audio worked better this week. Hopefully you like the new, the new environment, the new surroundings. This is the actual uh, ATA office up here in Boondle in, in, in Brisbane. Um, and I will see you next week. We'll keep doing these regularly, uh, weekly events, 7 o'clock each Tuesday uh, until, until the plans change. So uh, thank you all for showing up and see you next week. Budget naughty. Yeah, budget naughty. Hey, DJ, what do you think of the budget? Budget naughty. Yeah, budget naughty.